Anoy Kaufman, Inc. by George S. Kaufman, 1957. For some time now, I have suspected the existence of an organization whose scope and energies are so enormous that they stagger the imagination. I am not prepared to say with certainty that such an organization exists, but there are various recurrent phenomena in my life that can be explained only by the theory that a major plan is in operation, a plan so vast and expensive that it is almost impossible to envision it. The organization that carries out this plan must spend millions of dollars annually to achieve its object. It has, it must have, great suites of offices and thousands upon thousands of employees. On a guess, I would put its running cost at $10 million a year. If anything, the figure may be higher. With some presumption, I have christened it Annoy Kaufman, Inc., though I will admit that I cannot find that title in any lists of corporations. But the facts are incontrovertible. First, there is the matter of going to the bank. Let us say that I have run out of money and am required to cash a small check. Now, no one knows that I am going to the bank on that particular morning. There is nothing about it in the papers. I am not immodest, and I know that at best such an announcement would get only a few lines on a back page. George S. Kaufman is going to the bank this morning to cash a check. We wish him all success. Something like that. But not a word is printed. No one knows about it. As a matter of fact, I have probably not made up my mind to go until about 11 o'clock, yet the organization is prepared. It immediately arranges that half a dozen big companies should be drawing their payroll money that morning and that each of them should send a clerk to the bank with a list of payroll requirements. So many five-dollar bills, so many dollar bills, so many quarters, dimes, nickels, pennies. Next, it is arranged that all these people should get to the teller's windows just a few seconds ahead of me. Now this takes doing. Remember, the organization is not known just which morning I was planning to go to the bank, so for weeks and weeks these clerks have been held in readiness somewhere. And suppose I stop to talk to a friend and arrive five minutes later than expected. Obviously, several relays of clerks must be kept in reserve in a corner of the bank awaiting a signal. Moreover, these are not people who are just pretending to be cashing payrolls. The bank would never stand for that. No. They are people from real companies, companies founded by the organization and kept in business for years and years, probably at an enormous loss, just so that their representatives can get to the bank windows ahead of me. And it is not always the same people who stand in front of me. It is different ones. This in turn means a large number of separate companies to maintain. These companies run factories, keep books, pay income taxes, hold board meetings, advertise on television, pension their employees. Surely this side of the enterprise alone must run to a pretty figure. My next example may sound like a simple and inexpensive thing to manage, but it isn't. It has to do with the engineer's little boy, Danny. Danny is six years old. In fact, he has been six years old for the 35 years that I have been making overnight train journeys. I suppose that actually they keep on having an engineer's little boy born every year, but even that takes planning. Anyhow, for years and years, Danny has been begging his father to let him run the locomotive some night. For years and years, his father has been saying no. Then finally, the night comes. Can I run the engine tonight, Daddy? asks Danny, who is too young to know about can and may. And his father says, yes, Danny boy, we have just got word that Kaufman will be on the train tonight and he is very tired and needs a good night's sleep. So you can run the engine. So Danny runs the engine, the result being the neck-breaking stops and starts that keep me awake all night. The organization has, of course, the incidental expense of maintaining Danny in Chicago or Pittsburgh or Cleveland, as the case may be, until I am ready to make the return trip. Danny's father obviously cannot wait over to take care of him. He must go back to running the engine properly on the nights when I am not traveling. So the organization must keep branch offices in Chicago and Pittsburgh and Cleveland and wherever else I may go and provide someone to take care of Danny and schools for him to go to and somebody to make sure that he doesn't practice and so learn how to run the engine better before I make my return trip. This seemingly small part of the business can run to fantastic sums over the years. But the bank and Danny are, after all, relatively minor matters. 
Once done with, they are over till the next time. I come now to the major opus, the basic activity for which Annoy Kaufman Inc. was founded. Years ago, when I moved to New York, I noticed that a little man in a gray overcoat was watching me closely as I took the ferry from Jersey City to 23rd Street. I don't know why, but I think his name was Mr. Moffat. At all events, Mr. Moffat was the first person off the ferry boat when it docked. Hurriedly joining his pals in a midtown office, Mr. Moffat reported as follows. Boys, he's here. We can take out incorporation papers in Albany tomorrow and go to work. In a day or two, I'll have all the dope for you. Now, you may think it arrogant of me to claim that the entire rebuilding of New York City at present in full bloom came about solely as a result of my arrival here, but I can only cite the facts. No sooner did I move to a given neighborhood than the wreckers were at work on the adjoining building, generally at 8 o'clock in the morning. The pneumatic asphalt ripper, with which we are all now familiar, was first used early one morning as a weapon against the slumber of none other than myself. The first automatic rivet came into existence to be the destroyer of my sleep. All dates and names of streets are on file in the office of my attorney. Naturally, I kept moving to new neighborhoods in quest of peace, but the boys were always ready and waiting. Can you blame me for feeling that it was I and I alone who unwittingly charted the course of the city's onward sweep? Only once in all these years did they slip up. Acting without sufficient research, they put up Lever House just to the south of me, unaware that my bedroom was on the other side of my apartment. Discovering their error, they of course bought the property to the north and went quickly to work. Well, sir, heads rolled in the office that morning, I can tell you. Mr. Moffat, I like to think, shot himself, but I suspect he was immediately succeeded by his son, and since then the organization has functioned so efficiently that I am now exactly thirty-seven years behind on sleep, with only an outside chance of making it up. With all that on their hands... You wouldn't think they'd have time for congressional lobbying, too, would you? This ultimate move came to light during a visit of mine to Washington a few weeks ago. Having been made suspicious over the years by my dealings with the Internal Revenue people, I went to the trouble of looking up the original text of the income tax law as filed in the Library of Congress. Sure enough, there it was. Paragraph D, Clause 18, just as I had suspected. The taxpayer, in computing the amount of tax due to the government, may deduct from his taxable income all legitimate expenses incurred in the course of conducting his business or profession, except, it added, in the case of George S. Kaufman. <laughs>